Now, dinosaurs ruled our planet for over 165 million years, and some walk on our planet even today. Well, at least some of their descendants. Our modern birds evolved from what used to be a scary group of meat-eating dinosaurs we know as theropods. It all started during the Mesozoic era, about 250 million years ago, when a group of creatures called dinosaurmorphs roamed Earth. They didn't look like those dinos that might have come to your mind, like Brontosaurus or T-Rex. But that's the group dinosaurs evolved from. These creatures walked on all fours and were as big as house cats. They didn't look as friendly, though, considering they were more like weird lizards with long, thin limbs. As you'd expect, this group wasn't exactly at the top of the food chain. But they were really fast and agile, which helped them survive. Over time, they adapted and started walking upright, so their legs were under their bodies instead of out to their sides. And over time, dinosaur morphs started growing long tails and bigger leg muscles. Their necks became stronger to support the new position they were in, and they even got extra hip bones that helped them move faster and more efficiently. That's when dinosaurs came on the scene, somewhere between 240 and 230 million years ago. Their name comes from the word dinosauria, which means terrible lizard. The oldest dinosaur fossils belong to these fellows that lived in Argentina. This one is even older, but we're still not sure if it's a real dinosaur or its relative, dinosaur morph. Now, considering the size of their ancestors, dinosaurs weren't large at the beginning, more like dogs or horses. There weren't many species back then, so if you could go back to that time, you'd see a bunch of reptiles walking around on two legs. But as time went by, they adjusted to different environments, and we got more interesting groups. For example, small and fast predators, like this guy. They all fall into the category of archosaurs, a group that also includes pterosaurs. Yup, their name may not imply it, but these are not dinosaurs. As some dinosaur morphs evolved into dinosaurs, they got certain advantages, like arms. They could do much more thanks to that. Some could catch prey using their hands. Others could grasp branches. Now, the freedom they got by moving their arms later helped some of them evolve into birds and start flying. Dinosaurs were probably warm-blooded. It means they could stay active all the time. They didn't depend on the conditions around them like, for example, reptiles do. The latter are cold-blooded, and they have to rely on their surroundings to regulate their body temperature. Dinosaurs didn't rule the animal kingdom for the first tens of millions of years of their existence, either. Crocs were at the top of the food chain back then. Then the Jurassic period hit, and new kinds of dinosaurs showed up, like those giant plant-eating dinosaurs. For example, seropods. You know them. Dinos with long tails and necks that could eat plants at different heights, such as Brachiosaurus. Allosaurus is another famous dino from that time you will probably recognize. Spikes on the tail, bony plates on the back, you know, good old Stegosaurus. The Jurassic period was that time when dinosaurs started to get bigger and bigger. Then the Cretaceous period came along, and finally, these magnificent beasts reached the peak of their fame. That was the time when the mighty T-Rex took the throne and got to the top of the food chain. T-Rex probably lived around 28 years, but it reached adult size really fast. Now, it wasn't easy to survive back then. T-Rex falls into the category of tyrannosaurs, and scientists have found out those fellas were fierce even when they were at a pretty young age. They discovered a fossil of a teenage tyrannosaur that was 75 million years old, and it had two baby dinosaurs inside its stomach. Mm. They realized that when tyrannosaurs were at a young age, they went for small dinosaurs, such as these guys, their dino cousins. As they grew older, they started taking on bigger challenges, like those peaceful giant dinosaurs that like to hang out with their group and eat plants. But large predators weren't the only ones that would have made you shiver with fear. That was also the time when fast and smart creatures called velociraptors show up. They weren't some scaly dinosaurs that would catch their prey using those claws in the shape of sickles, like shown in the movies. Their bodies were covered in feathers, and they would grow up to 100 pounds, which is about the size of a wolf. And to bust one more myth, they didn't hunt in packs. Velociraptors probably preferred to hunt solo and use their claws not to slash their prey, but to clutch it. 
T-Rex and Velociraptor fall into the group called theropods. We mentioned them at the beginning, the creatures today's birds evolve from. But even though Velociraptors were covered with feathers, they still couldn't fly. Their wishbones weren't shaped in a way to support flying, and their arms were too short. Maybe it was better that way because during the Cretaceous period, flying dinosaurs called pterodons were the ones that took over the skies. Things had been going really great for dinosaurs until one unfortunate day 66 million years ago when an asteroid hit our planet. It's not that the asteroid itself erased all the dinosaurs right away, but it caused changes in the environment, which made it way harder to survive. At that time, about 75% of animals living on our planet went extinct. The asteroid was really big. When it hit Earth, it created a giant crater in the Yucatan Peninsula and sent a lot of debris into the atmosphere, which blocked the sun right away. For months, dense clouds of dust blocked sunlight. Our home planet was darker and colder than before, which wasn't good for plants. Creatures that ate plants couldn't survive those changes either. So it all turned into a chain reaction when most of the ecosystem collapsed. When the dust finally cleared, all those greenhouse gases that had formed after the impact made temperatures go way higher than they had been in a really short period of time. All land animals that weighed more than 55 pounds were gone. But not everything disappeared. There were fewer plants, but they were less affected than animals. All because their pollen and seeds can survive really messed up conditions for a longer time. So what we have today is basically the seeds we were left with back then. After the asteroid hit, flowering plants dominated our planet. All non-bird dinosaurs went extinct too. Some species survived as birds. At first, those brave survivors were small. But later, birds evolved to bigger sizes. Now, there's a study that says that if the asteroid had slammed into some other spot on Earth, the fate of many creatures and plants would have been very different. If the rock had fallen maybe a couple of minutes later, it would have hit deeper waters. Less rock would have vaporized and risen to block out the warmth and light coming from the sun. In that scenario, we'd probably still have dinosaurs around. For example, Triceratops was one of the last dinos that had nothing in common with birds. If the asteroid had missed our planet, we would see some of them still roaming around. But since evolution never rests, maybe in a little bit different form. Hundreds of dinosaur species roamed our planet, and researchers give a name to a new type approximately every two weeks. It's not fair to stick to T-Rex, Stegosaurus, Spinosaurus, and other famous sauruses all the time. They've had their chance to shine in the movies and across the internet. So let's check out dinosaurs that no one talks about. First on our list is Taurosaurus. The special thing about this dinosaur is that it definitely had one of the largest skulls ever found. It was big because of this frill going from the back of the animal's skull and covering its neck. The frill wasn't there for protection. It was probably just to show off a bit. The bone in the frill was thin and full of holes. As you can see, it's very similar to Triceratops. There are still debates about whether these two are the same species. But more and more studies show that they were more like cousins. They were probably similar in size, but Taurosaurus had a longer head with big openings, as well as longer frill bones with a groove on top. It also had more pairs of horns on the back of the frill. Some like to call Taurosaurus a bull lizard. These fellows were plant eaters that may have lived in social groups. They existed at approximately the same age, but Taurosaurus somehow ended up on the less popular side of the family. Kentrosaurus was a small stegosaurus. It's one of the least cuddly dinosaurs of all time. Its long, thin spikes seemed to be a pretty good defense mechanism. Stegosaurus, on the other hand, had shorter, thicker spikes that were less likely to bend or snap when the animal used them. Now, you wouldn't want to get anywhere near Kentrosaurus, though. Its tail could swing in a big half circle and hit with a force strong enough to break a human skull. Any volunteers? No? Okay. One scientist used scans of the dino's fossils to make a computer model of its skeleton. The model showed that Kentrosaurus had a flexible neck, 
It must have been really useful for looking around to see if something interesting was going on or if there was any dangerous animals trying to sneak up. Kegesaurus typically walked on all four legs with straight hind limbs. The computer model tells us it could spread its front legs out to its sides, too. Maybe it was a way to protect its belly during fights. Stegosauruses, in general, had tails that were like big weights at the back of their bodies. That's why their balance point was closer to their hips. It's also the reason why they could easily stand on their hind legs and swing their tails around. So most people haven't heard of heterodontosaurs, even though their fossils show that dinosaurs got feathers way back before we thought and in groups where we didn't expect it. In 2008, paleontologists identified the first known skull of a baby heterodontosaurus, which was less than 2 inches long, smaller than a tea bag. This baby dinosaur had relatively big eyes and a short snout compared to bigger ones of its kind. Now, what's really interesting is that some scientists used to think that heterodontosaurus' tusks, like those of modern warthogs, only appeared when they were fully grown. But it seems they had them from the early stages of their life. Heterodontosaurus had five fingers on each hand, two of which were opposable. It was a good tool, considering the animal probably ate both plants and meat. Humans have different types of teeth, some for biting, some for chewing, and also canines. But most reptiles have just one kind of teeth. Hedrodontosaurus was special because it had three different types of teeth. Small peg-like ones, big teeth resembling canines, and square-shaped teeth that did the cutting job. Scientists are not entirely sure how this creature used these different types of teeth. Maybe it was for digging up roots, breaking into termite nests, or even defending themselves against dangerous animals. Okay, say this name with me now. Sidacosaurus. She was quite a common dinosaur in its time, but she never still gained popularity. Scientists found out that when these dinosaurs were young, they probably crawled, considering they had longer arms and short legs. But as they got older, between 4 and 6 years old, their hind legs started growing much faster and became much longer than their front legs. So, later in life, they likely didn't move on all fours anymore, but walked on two legs. Inside the stomach of one of these creatures, scientists found pebbles. This shows the animals either had a hard time digesting what it ate, or it didn't chew its food very well. Its beak looks quite familiar. That's how it got its specific name, a parrot lizard. It was really strong, and some believe the creature used it to crack and open tough nuts and seeds before the pebbles in its stomach helped mash them up for digestion. These guys might have been good at swimming. They had broad feet, and the shape of their tail could have helped them move in the water relatively easily. Some scientists even believe they might have spent most of their lives swimming in rivers and lakes. In 2004, researchers found something really sweet. 24 young parrot lizards huddled together. They were too big to be hatchlings, so it could be a bunch of teenagers who had left their nests and then formed a group where they could support one another and defend themselves better. But apparently, that plan didn't work out so well. Now, check this one out, Stygemolog, or as they call it, Styx Demon. We're looking at a peaceful, plant-eating creature with bony spikes and knobs on its skull. Most scientists believe it was a younger form of this fellow, even though they used to think they were a separate species. Stygemolog is smaller than its more popular cousin, but it's also more robust and has a pretty thick neck. This dinosaur, with small forelimbs and long hind legs, 3 feet high, which is half as high as an average human. That doesn't sound dangerous in the world of giant and fierce dinosaurs, but the animal had a very thick skull roof. Maybe it wasn't the strongest tool to defend itself, but it probably helped in combat with rivals from its own species. They most likely headbutted to win the hearts of their chosen ones. But rivals from its own herd were a piece of cake compared to the predators that might have gone after it. After all, this dino lived at the same time as old T-Rex. 
Now, when someone tells you to picture a dinosaur, Chisosaurus would probably be the last thing coming to your mind. It looks as if you've put together pieces of random animals and tried to make your friends believe this truly was a real animal that once roamed the Earth. But it's actually a dino, with giant sharp claws on its forelimbs, a bulky body, and a long neck ending with a tiny head. Now, don't let the claws scare you, though. These creatures didn't go after other animals since they were herbivores. But these claws could protect the animal from intruders and predators. The full scientific name of this creature describes it as a giant sloth-like reptile from China. This animal was one of the biggest and oldest members of the group where it belonged, which lived around 115 million years ago. No, I wasn't around then. At first, it was hard to tell which animals were related to this weird-looking dinosaur. But in the 1990s, scientists made a conclusion that they were modified plant-eating theropods, which is similar to carnivorous dinos. They also most likely had feathers and small wings, like some sort of a very big turkey. (laughs) So we're moving to 66 million years ago in the world where dinosaurs lived. What are we doing here? We're just watching these giant reptiles and waiting for one of the most massive disasters on our planet to strike. Right now, a giant asteroid bigger than Mount Everest is flying at a tremendous speed, exceeding the speed of sound 40 times in the direction of our planet from the depths of space. It passes through our atmosphere, heats up, and hits the coastal part of the island of Yucatan, which separates the Gulf of Mexico from the Caribbean Sea. The enormous release of energy destroys all living things in the area, on land and in the ocean. The air over the island is filled with smoke and ash. Yucatan Island has taken the brunt of the blow. The blast wave instantly turns the green territory into a giant, lifeless crater. The asteroid fell at the wrong time. By the moment of the catastrophe, Earth had already been undergoing devastating changes. Continents were separating from one another, and some volcanoes were waking up, pouring lava onto the ground. Dinosaurs had been almost on the edge of extinction, but the asteroid shaped their fate. Now, Yucatan looks like a giant funnel of melting rock. There are no more dinosaurs here. But what about those animals that were far from the crash site? The noise from the explosion was so loud that pterodactyls hanging out far from the crater flew up into the sky in fear. A Tyrannosaurus got distracted from its hunting and ran away as far as possible along with Triceratops. But somewhere even further in mainland Mexico, ancient lizards continued to chew grass and run around fields. They did notice a bright flash but didn't mind it. They didn't even hear the sound of the explosion because the sound wave dissipated in the air. No blast wave, no earthquake, and no meteor shower. Dinosaurs continue with their lives. Unfortunately, not for long. Most dinosaurs would have survived if the meteorite had fallen in a field, ocean, or any other place. Perhaps today, you would see them in nature reserves, but the meteorite fell in the most unfavorable place. According to studies, the giant rock had a 1 in 10 chance to destroy dinosaurs, and it took this chance. It wasn't a soft landing. The stone didn't slip on the ground, but hit the rocky terrain like a giant hammer. The catastrophe wasn't limited to a blast wave and a crater. The asteroid fell into large stalks of flammable materials. Simply put, the space rock got into a giant vat of combustible substances. This provoked a drop of millions of tons of soot and ash into the air. The fire quickly spread throughout the island, emitting black smoke into the sky. Dinosaurs living hundreds of miles away from the site are getting nervous. Feelings of anxiety are growing. Their inner instinct of self-preservation signals that disaster is coming. The sky becomes gray and darkens. Black clouds cover the sun and reflect the light. However, these are not just regular clouds, but volcanic ash. The asteroid fell at the most destructive angle. It also hit the coastal part, so the destruction reached the seabed filled with sulfuric acid. A 
And now it's all coming out. Toxic fumes get mixed with incandescent ash, soot, and metals the meteorite contained. A fiery hot cloud emits acidic smoke that is very harmful to health. And this cloud, driven by the winds, grows and stretches all over the continent. It's getting cold on the ground. Plants, grass, and trees are quickly withering. The green valley, saturated with life, becomes gray and lifeless, which leads to an imbalance in nature. Most dinosaurs can't get fresh grass and leaves. This problem also affects predatory reptiles since the number of herbivorous lizards significantly decreases. Animals start to freeze and starve. They move away to search for some food and find a warm place. But it's too late because a poisonous firestorm is approaching them quickly. Dinosaurs try to hide in burrows and caves. Some lizards are looking at the sky, which is getting darker each second. A tiny sparkle slowly falls from a black, fiery cloud. This is a particle of hot ash. It drops to the ground, touches the dry leaves, and sets them on fire. Millions of such particles fall to the ground. The forest flares up like a match. The smoke from the burning trees rises and becomes part of the expanding ash cloud. The more the fire spreads, the larger the ash cloud becomes. Sulfuric acid vapors mix with molten metal particles and fall to the ground as poisonous droplets. Acid rain corrodes vegetation and poisons the soil. Flying lizards rise into the sky and enter the center of the firestorm. Dinosaurs on the ground are running from the forest towards the water, but it's impossible to escape from the apocalypse. The scale of the disaster is increasing exponentially. While acid rain and firestorms destroy one part of the continent, the coastal side faces another problem. The fall of the meteorite caused a giant tsunami. It hits the shore and floods large areas of land. After the massive explosion, the first wave forms. It could quickly destroy modern-day New York. A series of smaller waves, the size of a five-story building, sweep across the Atlantic Ocean and the North Pacific Ocean. Giant tsunamis are not so scary for deep-sea dinosaurs, but the poisonous cloud poses a danger to them. Particles of sulfur and ash cover the sky above the water surface and bring down poisonous rain. Seaweed and phytoplankton don't survive it. Thus, millions of fish face the threat of famine. This causes huge problems for the whole food chain in the ocean. Giant sea lizards can't survive either. The meteorite created a domino effect that put the entire continent under threat of extinction. A few weeks have passed. The ashes have settled and cooled down. The fires are over and the air has become cleaner. The sun is finally peeking through the clouds. But the planet looks different now. Giant lizards don't exist on the planet anymore. Green forests have turned into gray fields. Fortunately, not for long. The seeds of plants and trees have survived the apocalypse and are now blooming with renewed vigor. Nature is filled with colors again. Little creatures similar to rats have been hiding in the ground and have also survived. And now they finally get out to continue spreading life. It wasn't firestorms, tsunamis, fires, and lack of sunlight that destroyed the dinosaurs. The primary damage to the world at that moment was the disruption of the food chain. All big herbivorous dinosaurs and giant toothy monsters lost their food sources. Small animals and some flying dinosaurs survived to further evolve into modern birds and mammals. Large animals the size of a rhinoceros appeared 15 million years after the disaster. Tens of millions of years passed since that moment, and then humanity appeared. Thanks to modern technology, we've discovered the reasons for the destruction of dinosaurs. We don't know every detail, but we have a common picture of those events. And the scariest thing is that if the same asteroid fell again into some explosive terrain, we wouldn't be able to do anything about it, and our remarkable technologies wouldn't help much. Yes, we might disperse ash clouds and extinguish some fires, but it would be insignificant. Floods, fires, and acid rain would make life in big cities unbearable. 
The only thing that would help us survive could be underground bunkers and other reliable shelters. But how to survive the famine that would come after the destruction of vegetation and crops? We are developing and improving technologies that can protect us from asteroids, like lasers or space rockets with explosives. But even if we destroy one big rock, it might tear into a million pieces. Some will burn up in the atmosphere, and some will fall on the planet in the form of a meteor shower. Anyway, we'll face huge natural disasters. Therefore, all we can do now is hope that no rock from space will come to us. Boom! An explosion of supersonic waves, interplanetary heat, dust, fumes. The Earth's atmosphere has been invaded by a cosmic rock the size of Everest. A few seconds ago, this rock, weighing trillions of tons, was hurtling towards Earth. It could fly from New York to Anchorage faster than you could fry yourself an omelet. This monster's name? The Chicxulub Incident. Epic name, right? 66 million years ago, it crashed into the Earth. Back then, dinosaurs ruled the planet, but not for long. The epic collision took place in modern Mexico, in the Yucatan Peninsula, right near Cancun, where the dinosaurs were vacationing. Well, probably not. Still, the huge space rock hit the ocean, but even all that water couldn't stop the inevitable. The collision caused a huge amount of energy to be released. The horror on a planetary scale had begun. Imagine a mini sun lighting up the surface of the Earth with tsunamis the height of the Statue of Liberty bursting from the epicenter of the watery impact. Hmm, not good. The blast blew through the surface of the Earth. It was as hot as an oven and burnt everything in its path. The impact provoked a colossal earthquake and serious volcanic activity. A bunch of volcanoes simultaneously released hot lava and ash into the prehistoric skies. Millions of tons of ash and soot poisoned the air. This formed a huge ash cloud in the atmosphere, which blocked out the sun's rays for several years. The long winter had begun. Only, there wasn't any snow falling from the sky, but rain made of sulfuric acid. Yes, the Chicxulub incident might just be the most important thing that ever happened in the history of our planet. Even more than YouTube. Back then, there were loads of volcanic eruptions, a lot of flammable oxygen in the atmosphere, constant temperature changes. It was the perfect and worst time for all of this to go down. So, how are we so sure about all this? Well, the asteroid left an absolutely huge crater on the planet's surface. Today, this scar is hidden under the Gulf of Mexico. Scientists found a lot of places on Earth with abnormally high levels of iridium. This metal is very rare on Earth, but it's in a lot of asteroids that scientists have examined. Scientists studied some 66 million year old rocks. In the layers of rock, they found dust, the same dust that comes from asteroids. This could only have happened if a huge asteroid had crashed into Earth. The catastrophe led to the extinction of not only the dinosaurs, but also the asteroid. It was so hot at the point of impact part of the asteroid just disappeared. A lot of water vapor and carbon dioxide shot up into the atmosphere. But the biggest problem? Sulfur. It got kicked up by the asteroid impact and flew up into the air. These tiny sulfur particles blocked out a lot of the sun's rays. Without the sun, a lot of plants disappeared and the climate eventually got colder. The immense heat turned stones into glass. Scientists call these things tektites. The energy of the impact threw them up into the skies. After a short flight, the tektikes fell down to Earth. But it wasn't pretty. Rain fell too. Only instead of drops of water, you'd have seen hot glassy fireballs. They bombarded the planet's surface for days. The tektikes set fire to everything. Scientists found evidence of this all over the world, not just near the collision site. But a lot of things from back then are still a mystery. Some scientists think that Chicxulub wasn't even an asteroid. It might have been a comet. Asteroids are mostly made of stone and metal. Most often, they kind of look like a potato. A comet contains rock, metal, and ice. Comets look like dirty cosmic snowflakes, complete with ammonia, methane, and carbon dioxide. Comets sometimes come from the Oort cloud. 
It's a huge cloud of ice and debris around our solar system. From time to time, comets break free from the pack and head towards our Sun. According to scientists, this special comet flew right past Jupiter. The gravity of that huge planet accelerated the comet even more. It flew towards the Sun, gaining more and more speed. The comet's outer ice shield started to evaporate, and it probably gave off a lot of dust and gas, which made it look like it had a tail. The Sun's gravity eventually shattered the comet apart. One of the fragments flew through space and crashed into the Earth 66 million years ago. So, asteroid or comet? The truth is, we'll never know. What we do know is that the Earth was seriously unlucky to be in its path, and it was never the same again. The catastrophe stopped the development of 75% of life on Earth. Some bigger marine animals, like crocodiles, turtles, and fish, survived the impact. Out of all land animals, the only ones to survive were the ones that were, on average, smaller than the modern raccoon. That includes a bunch of special species of dinosaurs, the ancient ancestors of birds. Scientists believe they survived for two reasons. After the huge impact, it took a long time for plants to start growing again. And a lot of animals didn't survive. Most remaining animals didn't have enough food. But these dinosaurs had a beak. With its help, they could split open nuts and dig seeds out of the soil. So they survived. The second reason is that these lucky guys had bigger brains. Some people think that they were able to cooperate with each other and quickly adapt to the new conditions. Other life forms survived too. Fungi and mold survived underground and underwater. Gradually, the darkness cleared away and ferns began to take over the lifeless landscape. After a few thousand years, forests started to reappear. The animals that survived were pretty much all inconspicuous and small creatures. They lived in burrows, safe from all that hot ash. Before the collision, mammals had lived in the shadow of dinosaurs. But with all the dinosaurs suddenly gone, things were about to change. Mammals were able to take over. They began to dominate life, at least on land. Back to the moment when everything changed. Turns out, it wasn't the size of the asteroid that made it so powerful. It was more about the angle in which it hit the Earth. If the angle of impact had been different, the dinosaurs might have even survived the catastrophe. So, what would that have looked like? Well, let's travel back. Way back. Oh no, there's a giant asteroid heading for Earth. Ah, oh wait, never mind, it missed. There are plenty of earthquakes, tsunamis, and volcanic eruptions every day. But dinosaurs don't mind that much. No big deal. Fast forward a few million years, and most of these ancient lizards have changed and are now unrecognizable. Thanks to a couple of ice ages, many dinosaurs are now totally covered with feathers to protect them from the cold. Mammals exist, but they're few and far between. You see a lot of bats in caves. There are tons of rat-sized rodents in the forests. During the day, they hide in the undergrowth or in burrows. At night, they go out in search of food. There are no horses, no elephants, or other large mammals. Why become large and eatable when there are so many dangerous reptiles with huge fangs around? There are no whales in the sea. Parrots, hawks, and pigeons are nowhere to be seen. But pterodactyls 2.0 whiz past you constantly. Some are about the size of a helicopter, while others are no larger than a swan. There are plenty of primates, but they're in no hurry to climb down from their trees and walk on two legs. No venturing out into the savanna, no evolution into Homo sapiens. In this alternate reality, open spaces are very dangerous. But then again, so are forests and trees. Nowhere is safe. To get some delicious primate treats, many smaller dinosaurs learned to climb trees. This was already happening back in the Cretaceous period, right before that huge asteroid just missed Earth. Whew, that would have been an epic collision. Dinosaurs have grown wiser since that near miss. Some are even as smart as a modern chicken. A large brain uses a lot of energy, and that's not always a good strategy for survival. Safer to keep brains small and keep making those teeth bigger and pointier.
tiny critters to colossal creatures, all animals are trying to escape from a wall of fire moving in their direction. The temperature is rising, and everything around starts catching fire. Soon, lots of animals and plants on Earth will cease to exist. This is the aftermath of a giant asteroid crashing into our planet. But what if dinosaurs had had critical thinking skills? They could have guessed what was going to happen, because this asteroid was visible a year before the impact. One year before the impact. With no city lights, all bright spots in the sky are stars. Some of them are planets reflecting the light coming from the sun, like Mars. But one of these dots is the asteroid. Later, it's going to be known as Chicxulub Impactor. It got this name because of the region of modern-day Mexico where it fell. Anyway, at this point, the asteroid looks like a star. It has the same brightness as Neptune. You could even have photographed it with a high-quality camera. If only dinosaurs had thumbs. The impactor is now passing through Jupiter's orbit. From this distance, Earth looks like a pale blue dot. One month before impact. The asteroid has become much brighter. It's now the most brilliant spot in the night sky after the moon. The asteroid crosses the orbit of Mars. Its tail, consisting of dust and gas, is getting longer and longer. It's now as long as two times the distance from Earth to the Moon. One week before the impact. The intruder's tail is now five times the distance from the Earth to the Moon. But the dinosaurs can't appreciate its beauty. To them, it's just another bright dot in the night sky. If this asteroid were flying toward Earth right now, scientists could pinpoint the exact location of its impact within a mile. Then we would evacuate people from the impact area and avoid a major catastrophe. One day before the impact. The Chicxulub impactor now holds first place among the brightest objects in the sky. The light surrounding it, called the halo, seems even bigger than the moon itself. The asteroid is now passing through the moon's orbit. It looks like a bright spot that leaves an ashy trail behind it. One hour before the impact. The light from the Chicxulub impactor is brighter than the full moon and its movement can be seen with the unaided eye. Nights on Earth aren't dark anymore. Only now, dinosaurs begin to feel anxious. All animals on Earth start to seek shelter. 10 minutes before the impact. The asteroid is now passing through Earth's orbit. Thousands of small fragments from its tail begin to fall on the planet. It looks like a meteor shower. So far, these fragments are too small. They all burn up in the atmosphere before reaching the surface of the planet. The asteroid is approaching South America. If someone was looking at it from Europe, it looked like a sunset. The bright dot of the Chicxulub impactor is falling behind the horizon. Two minutes before the impact. Dinosaurs can now easily see the asteroid shape. If they knew how to do it, they could even estimate its size. It's a bit more than six miles across, which means it's almost the size of Manhattan Island. And the giant's weight is 15 plus 15 zeros pounds. It's flying toward the Yucatan Peninsula at a mind-boggling 7.5 miles per second. At that speed, you could get from New York to Los Angeles in around 10 minutes, but you'd kind of burn up on the way. 10 seconds before the impact. The Chicxulub impactor is now approaching the ground. A few more feet and BAM! The night sky suddenly turns white. The flash is so bright that the sun isn't visible at this point. The asteroid's entry causes a powerful blast that can be heard on the other side of the world. The huge asteroid begins to burn because of friction with the air. It heats up and splits into many pieces. These pieces shower on Earth. After a few seconds, the largest part of the meteorite hits the ground. Its mass and speed provide the Chicxulub impactor with an enormous amount of energy. In the next moment, a super-powerful explosion shakes the ground. The blast wave from the meteorite begins to spread out from the impact site. It rips out huge chunks of soil and trees and then pushes them to the ground like dominoes. The temperature of the blast wave is so high that everything around the impact site catches fire. The energy released during the collision also penetrates deep into the planet. This causes the strongest earthquakes in our planet's history. They, in turn, generate tsunami waves as high as the Empire State Building. Five minutes after the impact. The meteorite leaves behind a huge crater. It's as wide as Lake Huron and deep enough to fit inside two and a half Mount Everests. Dinosaurs are running around in panic. They try to evacuate toward North America, but most of them don't make it through unfamiliar swampy territories. Another danger is the ongoing meteor shower. Hundreds of tons of ash and debris rise into the air. 
heated up by high temperatures, they fall to Earth in the form of liquid lava. Ash and smoke fill the atmosphere and block the sun's rays. Earth plunges into darkness. For several more weeks, our planet will be totally dark. Acid rains will fall on its surface nonstop. There was a lot of sulfur in underground deposits on the Yucatan Peninsula. The energy of the explosion evaporated all this sulfur. Now it's cooling in the air, gathering in clouds, and dripping to the ground. Most animals survived the impact, but the mass extinction continues for many more months. The collision has plunged Earth into darkness, and this has wiped out most of the plants that fed on sunlight. The plant-eating dinosaurs have lost their main food source and begin to disappear. But plant-eating dinosaurs are the main diet of meat-eaters. And now, dinosaurs like T-Rex have nothing to eat. Soon, they go extinct too. In other words, it wasn't a meteorite that wiped out dinosaurs, but hunger and climate change. Meteorites of this size fall once every 100 million years. It means that such an event might happen again. Will humans manage to survive this disaster? These days, we can look out far into space. And the appearance of an asteroid the size of the Chicxulub impactor won't be a surprise to astronomers. In general, asteroids that are more than 460 feet across are considered potentially dangerous. Anyway, if we know about the approaching space body, we'll be able to build shelters filled with food and water supplies. Once the asteroid is close enough, we can wait for the impact and its consequences inside. But when people come back to the surface, they'll see cities and towns torn down. Our planet will look like a lifeless desert. That's why we need another alternative, which is to prevent the impact. Here, we have many options, depending on the size and material of the asteroid. According to NASA, the most effective way is a kinetic ram. We'll need to send a fairly large and heavy object, such as a spaceship, into space. When it approaches the asteroid, scientists will choose the perfect trajectory, and the ship will crash into the space body. A powerful collision will change the asteroid's course, making it fly past Earth. The further this space body is from our planet, the easier it'll be to send it away. Another option is a controlled explosion on the surface of the asteroid. Newton's first law of motion will help us here. It says if a body is moving at a constant speed in a straight line, it will keep moving that way unless it is acted upon by a force. So if we make a big enough explosion or force, the asteroid will shift its trajectory. How much it moves depends on the amount of force applied to it. We can also blast the asteroid right from inside. In this case, there will be no need to change its trajectory. Instead, we'll try to turn one huge hunk of rock into a bunch of smaller fragments. They will burn up in the atmosphere and do no harm to our planet. Another way is a gravity tug. Every heavy object has its own gravitational force and gravitational field. Our goal will be to send a spacecraft to the asteroid and make it fly close to the intruder. The asteroid will attract the spaceship, but its engines will resist. As a result, the ship will slowly but surely pull the asteroid toward itself. This method will take much longer, but gradually, the trajectory of the asteroid will change and it won't crash into Earth. Hopefully. We can also use solar power. We can build a spaceship with a system of giant magnifying lenses. Then we'll send that station closer to the sun. When we spot an asteroid, we'll point the lens in its direction and focus the beam on the space body. The heat from the sun will cause the asteroid's material to evaporate. Eventually, this will make the intruder change its trajectory. Traveling back in time now? Hmm, this used to be hard. We fly past the Middle Ages, the first human civilization, the ancient ancestors of the first humans, the dinosaurs, the first land animals, the ancient sea creatures, and so on to the very beginning of all time. And there it is! This nebula is our solar system. Right now, it's just a cloud of multicolored dust made of hydrogen and helium spinning around. This cloud has begun to shrink and become denser. There's a theory that there were supernova explosions near our nebula. Their shock waves squeezed the nebula from different sides until the center of the cloud became too heavy. The enormous weight presses it, and nuclear chain reactions begin at the very center of this cloud. It heats the cloud and makes it glow. Soon, it forms into a dense sphere, and that's how our sun is born. It happened about 4.5 billion years ago. Our planet doesn't exist yet. There's only a disk of dust and space debris orbiting the young sun. These pieces of debris are fusing gradually and getting heavier and heavier. Let's look at the very center of this pile of asteroids. 
The total weight of the debris compresses the central region so much that a dense metallic core is forming there. The enormous pressure heats the core, and the temperature at the center of the young Earth reaches nearly 10,800 degrees. And there's a liquid core around the solid one. It creates the magnetic field of our planet. Now, when radiation from the sun and the solar wind reaches Earth, it smashes into a shield in the form of our magnetic field. So far, our planet is burning and looks more like a ball of lava. But it begins to cool down, forming a solid crust. At this point, another protoplanet appears on the horizon. It looks more like an asteroid the size of Mars. And this massive piece of debris flies towards us. It hits the young Earth at such an angle that it knocks a part of our planet outward. The debris itself breaks into several pieces and stops in our orbit. After a while, all of this debris comes together to form the Moon. As a result of this collision, the Earth began rotating too fast. A day now lasts about 5 hours, instead of the usual 24. But the Moon is heavy enough to slow our planet's rotation with gravity. Now, the Earth doesn't look like a hospitable place. The gravitational forces of the Moon are penetrating deep into the Earth and causing more volcanic activity. Also, meteorites are constantly falling here, causing frequent explosions on the surface. Ow! The gas that comes out of the volcanoes forms our atmosphere. The ice that was brought to our planet on meteorites evaporates. The vapor rises and turns into rain. This rainwater falls to the surface, cooling the hot lava and forming the first lakes and rivers. For several hundred million more years, Earth resembles the surface of Venus. It's a lifeless place with a bunch of volcanoes, acid rains, and no oxygen to breathe. The sun wasn't as bright as it is now. Plus, the sun's rays could barely pass through tons of volcanic dust in the atmosphere. But about 3.5 billion years ago, the first life appears here in the form of single-celled organisms that didn't need oxygen. They appeared in the shallow, warm parts of the ocean near the shore. These bacteria reigned on Earth for nearly 2 billion years throughout the Archean Eon. They left stromatolites. These are stone pillars at the bottom of shallow warm water. They're the product of simple organisms and bacteria. These bacteria evolved until they learned photosynthesis. Bacteria began to produce oxygen by absorbing the energy of sunlight. At first, this oxygen was spent on oxidizing rocks, but then excess oxygen began to fill the atmosphere. Plus, at this time, the first algae appeared, which also produced oxygen. This event is called the Great Oxidation Event, good name, which caused almost all living organisms to disappear from the face of the Earth. For simple organisms, oxygen was toxic, and the remains of bacteria and microorganisms sank to the bottom of the ocean. Many millions of years later, these remains will be recycled, and under the tremendous pressure of water and the Earth's crust, they will turn into oil. The Archean Eon ended with this catastrophe about 2.5 billion years ago. At the same time, continents were forming on Earth, which would later drift through the world's oceans like puzzles and form a supercontinent. But for now, methane and carbon dioxide still make up most of the atmosphere. They cause the greenhouse effect and the rising temperatures on Earth. But the emergence of oxygen stops the greenhouse effect, and the temperature on our planet drops. An ice age, the so-called Huronian glaciation, which lasted from 2.4 to 2.1 billion years ago, begins. Scientists speculate that our planet was almost completely covered in ice at that time, even on the hot equator. A huge change when you consider that 2 billion years ago, our planet was like a ball and lava, but now it's like a block of ice. Earth, during the Huronian glaciation, was more like Jupiter's satellite Europa. There, too, is a thick crust of ice, under which there's a liquid ocean heated by the core. The evolution of the Sun saved our planet. Since its birth 4.5 billion years ago, it's been getting bigger and hotter. So, after 300 million years of an ice age, the Earth began to warm up. But almost all life there had been wiped out, and evolution has to start all over again. About 1 billion years ago, all of the continents of our planet were assembled into one hypothesized supercontinent, Rodinia, and all the oceans made up one colossal ocean of Muravia. 750 million years ago, that continent broke apart and huge chunks of land began drifting across the planet. Complex plants and multicellular organisms appeared just at this time. Algae, sponges, and fungi weren't the only inhabitants of the ocean. This is Sprigina. They're a kind of worms the size of a human finger. 
We have remains of these animals that are at least about 550 million years old. 541 million years ago, the Phanerozoic Eon began. The main event at that time is the Cambrian Explosion. Life began to blossom on Earth, and a great variety of living organisms appeared. Mollusks and echinoderms like starfish and sea urchins appeared. Living organisms evolved, having not only an internal but also an external skeleton, like trilobites. Some of these things could reach nearly 3 feet in length. Their protective shells suggest that there were predators in the ocean. A food chain started forming at that time. At the same moment, the drifting continents fused again. This supercontinent has a different shape and is called Panosia. Later, these continents drifted apart again and began to collide with each other. This led to the formation of mountain ranges. Then the continents met for the last time and formed the giant supercontinent Pangaea about 335 million years ago. Here we can already see the outline of the modern continents of Africa, North and South America, Australia, and Eurasia. One of the largest sea creatures ever, the Dunkleosaurus, appeared. Some individuals could be as long as a school bus and weigh as much as a large SUV. The land had a hot and humid climate. It encouraged ferns and other plants to grow faster. Some of them could reach the height of a three-story building. And for the first time in Earth's history, some animals leave the ocean and go on lands, such as El Genirpaton and Ichthyostega. Anyway, at first, they live only on the coast because their skin wasn't adapted to the constant sunlight. In addition, they experienced breathing problems. The first animals on land had both gills and lungs, but the lungs were underdeveloped, so they had to return to the water. Millions of years later, these animals evolved into more advanced amphibians. Though they were no bigger than ordinary lizards, they could already live fully on land. But this blossoming of life ended in a new ice age. Glaciers from the poles slowly crept toward the equator. Animals weren't prepared for this, and most of them didn't survive this extinction event. But 290 million years ago, evolution retook hold and more evolved land animals began to appear. Gradually, they increased in size, multiplied, and gave birth to a new species like Scutosaurus and Gorgonopsis. But this period didn't last long either. Only 40 million years later, as a result of unknown events, 95% of all living organisms on Earth ceased to exist. It could have been caused by a giant meteorite or by increased volcanic activity. Also, one hypothesis says it could have been the release of methane from the bottom of the ocean. The Mesozoic era began after this extinction. This is where the dinosaurs as we know them appeared and started a new page in Earth's history. You're picking some veggies in the garden. When you come across something big and round, it's covered in soil. When you dig it out, you find out it's a giant egg, bigger than one of an ostrich. But you don't have any chickens or ducks. And even if you did, none of those animals could lay an egg of that size. You pick it up. It seems real. You take the egg inside and build an incubator for it. A couple of days pass, but nothing. You go on with your life and forget about the egg's existence. You've been working in your garden all day long. All you want now is to get into a tub filled with hot water and have some dinner later. But while you're eating, you hear some noise coming out of the room with the incubator. You ignore it, thinking it's just some mice scampering around. But then the sound intensifies. You head there and see the eggshell cracking. In a couple of minutes, something begins to crawl out. You grab your phone and immediately start filming it. A tiny reptile pokes out of the now broken egg and starts examining its surroundings. You're shocked. You place your phone on a special platform to keep filming the creature. Meanwhile, you grab your laptop and begin researching what animal it could be. The creature doesn't have the snout of an alligator nor does it look like a Komodo dragon. You go back to your dinner and feed the reptile some leftover meatloaf. It gulps the food down in a flash. The next day, you build a small terrarium to keep an eye on your new pet. Over the following weeks, you record every second of its life. You call the reptile Buster. The creature has already grown to the size of a dog. It runs fast and jumps pretty high too. You think it might be some new reptile species. But it doesn't crawl like an alligator or a lizard. Your pet has two tiny arms and large legs. Its jaws are massive for an animal its size. The reptile also has razor-sharp teeth. Your friend comes over for a movie. 
At one point, your reptile runs into the living room and starts biting the furniture. Your friend freaks out and starts yelling, DINOSAUR! You calm him down and take the dino to the garage. You explain to your friend how you found the animal, and he tells you to contact someone to examine it. The next day, you take Buster to the vet and take a seat in the waiting room. You keep your pet in a cage so that no one can see it. But the dino starts growling in a strange way. Many people grab their pets and move away from you. It's finally your turn. You bring Buster in and show it to the veterinarian. The man looks shocked. He puts the creature on a metal examination table and starts looking closely at its features. Sharp teeth and claws, scaly skin. The vet tells you you've been raising a T-Rex for three weeks. He calls in other specialists to examine the animal. The next thing you know, you're in a lab with a bunch of scientists studying Buster. You sit there anxiously as they collect its DNA samples. They even ask for the footage you've been recording. After a couple of hours, they come back and tell you that you indeed have a dinosaur. They'll have to keep Buster in the lab to conduct further studies. So you go home feeling a bit lonely. A couple of years pass. Now you have a degree in paleontology specializing in T-Rexes. You've been working with the lab and monitoring Buster that has turned into a fully grown dino. You also teach at the university and have published a book called My T-Rex Buster. It has become a bestseller. One day, you come back from the university and turn on the TV. That's when you hear breaking news. A large creature has broken out of a lab outside the city. It's now on the loose. They show several images of the beast's footprints that lead to the forest. You get a call from the lab. They ask you to head down there as fast as you can. The researchers tell you what's happened and ask you to accompany them to the forest to find the dino. You put on a special protective suit and get into a jeep. After a couple of hours, you arrive at the spot where Buster was last seen. You get out and try to follow its footprints, but the rain has removed the marks the creature left almost completely. The scientists check the tracking device placed under the dino's skin, but it's not working. They bring some food Buster likes to try to lure it out. After a couple of hours, there's no news. It's already night when you hear some rumbling in the distance. Everyone jolts awake. People around you are on high alert. You hide and wait. A large shadow the size of a school bus appears from the dark. A fully grown T-Rex can reach 40 feet long and 12 feet high. The giant lizard approaches the meat and sniffs it. After a couple of moments, it runs off. Everyone gets out of their hiding places and tries to follow the animal. The meat has a special substance in it. It was supposed to put the dino to sleep. This way, it wouldn't be a problem to bring it back to the lab. But the dino was smart enough to feel something suspicious. Despite its size, the T-Rex is quite slow. It can move at a speed of only 12 miles per hour and can't even outrun a human. But Buster somehow manages to cross a raging river and disappears into the dark forest. No one has been prepared to make it through such an obstacle, so the whole team makes a detour through the mountains. It's a difficult climb, with everyone carrying the equipment needed to catch the T-Rex. From the height of the mountain, you can see almost all the forest. Far away, treetops are shaking. The giant reptile is heading to the north. Everyone tries to get to the other side of the mountain as fast as they can. But then, one of the crew members slips and falls. Good thing a safety rope holds her in place. You pull the woman back to the path. You continue walking until you reach a cave. Everyone puts on their helmets with flashlights and goes inside. The deeper you go into the cave, the smaller it gets, so you have to crawl to get through. The rocks are sharp, and there's water everywhere. It's easy to get lost in here. The cave starts trembling. Everyone rushes to get through the narrowest part. You finally make it out of the cave. That's when you find out that the cave was trembling because of the T-Rex. It was stomping around the mountain. It spots your group and starts running towards you. People panic and rush back into the cave. The T-Rex catches up with your team and tries to snatch someone. But by that moment, everyone is already safely tucked inside the cave. Suddenly you scream, Buster! Shockingly, it seems to calm the creature down. You step outside, even though everyone is trying to hold you back. You get outside and face the massive creature. It's just staring at you. You slowly approach it, trying not to make any sudden moves. 
Someone from inside the cave gasps. It startles Buster. It starts thrashing and roaring, but you are still there, trying to calm the animal down. Eventually, it gets quieter and comes closer. You put your hand on its head, caressing it. After a few seconds, someone inside the cave steps on a twig and it cracks. The T-Rex jolts and runs away. You're furious. Now, you have to track it once again. After you spend many more hours in the forest, the sun starts to rise. Everyone is exhausted and about to pass out. You decide to call it a day and head back home. But as soon as your team gathers near the jeeps, you receive a notification that a giant T-Rex has entered the city. A helicopter picks up you and the other team members. There isn't enough room for everyone, so several people stay behind, waiting for the next chopper. The T-Rex is dashing through traffic. People in the streets are running for their lives. Dozens of news companies are filming the incident. Many people are posting it on social media. The dino breaks into the mall and destroys everything it sees. Your helicopter lands and you get out, trying to think of a way to calm the creature down. You rush into the mall, but the T-Rex has already run away to the other side of the building and managed to escape. You're following it, but suddenly you get a phone call saying that the team members left behind in the forest have spotted your T-Rex. You can even see the live footage of the animal. That means there are two giant reptiles on the loose in your state. Big herds of dinosaurs run through the forest. The temperature rises rapidly and everything behind them begins to ignite. Some dinosaurs get stuck in swamps and can't get out. Pterodactyls fly over their heads as they try to avoid the blast wave that will soon cover the Earth. This event happened about 66 million years ago. It wiped out almost every living thing on Earth. Birds and flying dinosaurs were just about the only ones who could survive the most massive extinction event ever. Hey, don't blame me, I wasn't around then. Let's go down their evolutionary tree to look at the world's first bird, Archaeopteryx. It was about the size of a modern raven, but it looked like a small dinosaur with feathers. It had many small conical teeth, almost like alligators. It's because Archaeopteryx was closer to reptiles than to birds. However, its brain was three times larger than that of these reptiles. Although it had wings with feathers, it could hardly fly like modern birds. Its shoulder joints didn't allow it to lift its wings above its back, so it couldn't make a full wing beat. Most likely, Archaeopteryx was capable of gliding flights with small wing flaps. Evolution has led to more evolved species capable of full flight. Pterodactyls. These guys had no feathers, but membranes made of skin and muscle. Its wingspan was about the length of a human leg. It could fly perfectly and catch fish and small animals. Although flying dinosaurs could easily outrun terrestrial predators like velociraptors and T-rexes, most of them didn't make it through the impact of a giant meteorite. Let's look at this event step by step to see how they got to our time. 10 minutes before the meteorite crash. A massive rock about the size of Manhattan Island is moving towards Earth in space. It weighs 460 trillion tons. That's like 3 trillion blue whales, the heaviest mammals that ever lived on Earth. And it's approaching our planet at 12 miles per second. At that speed, it could cross the Atlantic Ocean in just 4.5 minutes. That's twice as fast as our modern spacecraft could fly. 5 seconds before the meteorite crash. Ooh, this is getting tense. The Earth's gravitational force continues to pull the giant meteorite. It blows a hole in our atmosphere and creates a popping sound so loud you could hear it on the other side of our planet. All the animals on our planet wake up in a panic. They lift their heads up and see a huge rock that begins to burn through the air. Smaller fragments start to break away from the main meteorite. This fire is so bright that it shines almost like the sun. Flying dinosaurs and other ancestors of modern birds are the first to sense danger. They make a beeline to the sky and try to fly as far away from the impact site as possible to save their lives. The moment of impact. The colossal mass and velocity of the meteorite give it an enormous amount of energy. As soon as it touches the Earth, it causes an explosion of 150 trillion tons of TNT. The blast wave literally rips out chunks of our planet and throws them up. A huge wall of energy begins to move from the point of impact in all directions. It snatches the trees out with their roots and pushes them to the ground like dominoes. The shockwave completely wraps around our planet. This energy turns into heat. Everything around the impact site begins to ignite. Green jungles and trees turn into smoldering charcoal in seconds. The ground and rocks simply evaporate. 
the collision caused a massive earthquake. Some dinosaurs may have fallen into cracks that appeared in the ground. A strong earthquake caused a tsunami, with waves higher than the Empire State Building. Dinosaurs that weren't trapped in the burning forest were washed away by the enormous waves. The dinosaurs of North America tried to escape by running to the north, but the blast wave inevitably catches up with them. Flying dinosaurs have no problem with earthquakes or tsunamis. They fly high enough to avoid the giant waves. But they will have to contend with continuously falling meteorite debris. Five minutes after the meteorite crash. A meteor shower of giant rock fragments continues to fall to Earth. Some meteorites were the size of a car. Others were more like a large building. Ashes and dust rise into the air. Their temperature is so high that they melt and turn into liquid lava and then fall back to Earth, causing more fires. Meteor showers cause trouble for flying dinosaurs, too. They have to maneuver and dodge the falling red-hot rocks. The high temperatures are a huge problem for them because it might make them lose feathers. With no feathers, they aren't able to fly. 10 hours after the meteorite crash. The dinosaurs continuously ran north all this time. They found themselves in unfamiliar territory with many swamps. Giant dinosaurs like T. rexes have legs as long as an adult human's height. They have a chance to get through this terrain, but if they fell, they could never get back up. The smaller dinosaurs, like Triceratops, had short legs and couldn't grow through the dense swamps. One month after the meteorite crash. 15 trillion tons of ash were ejected into our atmosphere. A dark cloud blocked the sun, and the Earth was immersed in complete darkness. Surviving plants couldn't feed on the sun's energy and stopped producing oxygen. Surviving dinosaurs could hardly breathe because of the lack of air and a large amount of dust. The lack of sunshine in the sky made photoplankton disappear. Many marine animals were left without their only source of food. The dust and ashes in the atmosphere prevent our planet from getting heat from the sun, and the temperature here is beginning to drop. The place where the meteorite fell was rich in sulfur. This toxic acid evaporated at the time of the impact and formed in clouds. Now there are acid rains on Earth. Flying dinosaurs now have to hide from these rains. They have to stay in caves and can't go outside to get some food. So far, a large number of terrestrial and flying dinosaurs have survived. They come out to see the aftermath of the disaster. The site of the impact was in present-day Mexico, the Yucatan Peninsula. The Chicxulub Crater is located here. It's about 93 miles wide, like half of all of Lake Michigan. And it's 12 miles deep. You could plunge the whole Mount Everest in there, and there would still be 6.5 miles of available space. It wasn't the impact itself that made the dinosaurs disappear. The fire destroyed most of the plants the herbivorous dinosaurs ate. With no food, their numbers dwindled rapidly. Predatory dinosaurs had nothing to eat either. Acid rain and the disappearance of photoplankton threatened all marine life. Even though birds managed to avoid the blast waves and tsunami, they were short of food too. About 80% of all birds didn't make it to the end of the extinction event. The problem was that all of the forests on Earth were wiped out. Most birds would nest and live in trees. Besides that, the forests were always full of food, from all kinds of ants and termites to flying insects and small mice. So only those species that lived on the ground and could fly well survived. Most likely, they fed on the seeds of small surviving plants. This habit made flying dinosaurs lose their teeth during evolution. Instead of jaws with a bunch of sharp teeth, they got long beaks to grab tiny seeds from the ground. Although Earth looks like a terrible place to live now, there's an evolutionary boom for birds. They have to travel long distances in search of food. Their wings get stronger. They also feel safe from predators who regarded them as food before. No T-Rex now catches a sleeping bird off guard. About a thousand years after the collision, the first dense forests appear. It gives another boost to evolution. A million years later, forests full of food are populated by the ancestors of modern mouse birds. And 65 million years later, in modern times, we have about 10,000 species of birds. Pigeons, crows, eagles, and hawks, even penguins. These are all descendants of the dinosaurs. But there were other survivors. Some alligator and crocodile ancestors were able to adapt to changing conditions. About 80% of turtle species managed to survive the mass extinction, and now their descendants live among us. Snakes and lizards were also able to wait out the hard times in their burrows. Even some mammals, like monotremes, survived. 
this hedgehog-sized animal was able to continue to evolve. Many millions of years later, these mammals evolved into primates, which later gave life to modern humans. Much, much later came the iPhone. Hey, it's possible that Jurassic World is not just a fantasy. Dinosaurs could really be walking, swimming, or flying around somewhere out there, but not on Earth. Some scientists think there may be planets far, far away from our solar system where slightly different versions of T-Rex and other dinosaurs live. They got the idea based on the fact that our planet used to have about 30% higher oxygen levels than today. That's why complex and intelligent life forms like dinosaurs could develop in the first place. They also want to explore basic building blocks that are the reason why we have life on Earth. These building blocks are something we know as amino acids. They make protein, sugars, and genetic material, RNA and DNA. They're consistent and mainly exist in one shape or orientation. There are two ways they can be oriented – right and left. That means they mirror each other, just like our hands. It's something we call chirality. For life to exist, proteins must have one form, which means they can be oriented right or left. On our home planet, almost all living things, from the smallest bugs to whales and elephants, have amino acids with a left-handed orientation. We're not exactly sure why things are set that way, but there's a theory that's because of meteorites that crash-landed on Earth 4 billion years ago. They brought specific kinds of amino acids and some other organic materials to our planet and somehow set the pattern we have today. Maybe we could use special telescopes we created to search planets, especially those where conditions are similar to how they used to be on Earth back in time when dinosaurs existed. In that case, it would be better to watch them from a safe distance, because considering what they might look like, researchers say it might be a safer choice. That's a cool idea, but it's still very tricky. The history of life on our planet, especially that of dinosaurs, involved many catastrophic events and mass extinctions. There's always more room for new theories about dinosaurs. One of them says oil comes from dinosaurs. Interesting, but not true. Oil formed from the remains of sea animals and plants from millions of years ago. This was way before dinosaurs appeared. Tiny organisms ended up at the bottom of the sea. As bacteria decomposed animals and plants, they removed most of the oxygen and some other elements from them. It left behind only a sludge, which was mostly made of hydrogen and carbon. As time passed, those remains became covered with many layers of silt and sand. When the depth of the sediment increased to 10,000 feet or even more, heat and pressure turned the remains into natural gas and crude oil. It's possible that dinosaurs lived or fell in the sea and later became petroleum in the same manner. But no one has ever found crude oil containing their skeletons. So this is just an unproven theory. Then there's the feathered dinosaur theory which, unlike the previous one, seems to have more foothold in reality. Back in 2010, researchers found evidence that 100 million years ago, there had been a dino species with ginger feathers. Another group of scientists claimed there had been a different species from 150 million years ago. Those dinos had freckles and reddish-brown feathers on the tops of their heads. The color patterns probably had their purpose. Maybe it was a way to communicate with other representatives of their species, or to attract mates. But years later, scientists studied the Microraptor, also called a feathered dinosaur. They realized it had probably been more like a bird than a dinosaur. The key point is how birds replace their feathers. Birds that fly have to replace their feathers in a specific order, otherwise they won't be able to fly very well. And the Microraptor's fossils showed that this creature had changed its feathers in a similar pattern. So they're not really sure which category this animal falls into. Dinosaurs that had feathers shed a lot of their skin piece by piece, like dandruff. Hey Bob, looking a little flaky there. Need a new shampoo? 
Yeah, they didn't shed their skins like lizards do, as if they take off an old suit. When we talk about dinosaurs, we usually don't picture them as social creatures, more like isolated ones similar to lizards. But some researchers discovered an 80-million-year-old collection of clutches in the Gobi Desert. It means there were colonies of dinosaurs that protected their nests and guarded their young, similar to birds. Crocodiles are known for doing that, too. Pterosaurs were flying dinosaurs, and pelicosaurs were fin-backed ones. Some studies have shown that these two species use their exaggerated head crests and sails or fins to get to their potential partners. There are many theories about their crests and what they were needed for, though. Some experts believe that was how dinosaurs regulated their temperature. Others think they needed a crest to steer through the air. It's hard to say anything for sure, since their fossils are rare and they don't have living descendants. But the most likely option is that the crest had the same purpose as a peacock's tail and was used for selecting mates. The bigger the crest, the more chances a pterosaur had to get a partner. You know theropods, those scary meat-eating predators that are shown in most dinosaur movies? Well, they might have enjoyed eating plants way more than tearing flesh. Not all of them, but it's possible that many of them weren't as fierce as we might think. Those big scary ones, like T-Rex, could be exceptions rather than the rule. The thing is, movies show these creatures to be way faster than they probably were in reality. They could probably run just a little bit more quickly than the average human runner. Scientists study the diet of Silurosaurs. Those seem to be the closest relative to birds. It was hard to figure it out because some of the dinos from this group had pig-like teeth, or in some cases, no teeth at all. To understand what they ate, researchers had to look for direct evidence and check if there was anything in their stomachs. And after they discovered certain things, including a beak with no teeth, they realized these fellas had followed a vegetarian diet most of the time. Even some famous ones, such as velociraptors, could be just innocent plant eaters and not terrifying beasts from Jurassic Park and our childhood nightmares. Over 10 years ago, scientists found fossils of a small dinosaur. It was a creature as big as a parrot with long legs. It came from a family with some of the most famous predators we know about, such as T. rex and Velociraptor. Most dinosaurs that lived on land had five fingers, but later some of them ended up with fewer fingers. This new one they discovered was special because, instead of having three fingers, which was more common for its family, it had just one finger with a sharp curved nail at the end of each front limb. This creature probably used this one finger to dig into insects' nests to feast. Even though we know all about the asteroid that wiped out dinosaurs, some have other theories. One paleontologist even had an idea that dinosaurs had possibly reached their end because they had been eating one another. This especially worked for ancestors of fierce, scary predators such as the Tyrannosaurus rex. It's possible they ate so many eggs of other dinosaurs that many species just went extinct. Once they started eating the eggs of very big dinos that we know as sauropods, it's possible they started getting bigger too. And no dinosaur mother could stop them from eating her eggs because she couldn't be around all the time. There were other big predatory animals that ate eggs, even early mammals. But in any case, later research showed dinosaurs couldn't have eaten enough eggs to have caused mass extinction. And that's all I have to say about that.